Welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Brian Clark, a senior fellow at the Institute and director of Hudson Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Uh, today, we are joined by two uh, influential uh, defense thinkers in Congress who are going to talk uh, about the challenges facing the U.S. maritime industrial base. Uh, this discussion is very salient right now. The Shipyard Act, which was recently introduced by these two congressmen, as well as some co-sponsors, is currently making its way through uh, the congressional uh, consideration process. At the same time as we have the Biden administration uh, building a uh, building support behind an infrastructure plan that might or might not include uh, the shipbuilding and ship repair industrial base. Uh, our guests today are uh, Congressman Rob Whitman from uh, Virginia's first congressional district. Uh, he's been in Congress since 2007. And he is the vice ranking member of the House Armed Services Committee. He also sits on the Sea Power and Projection Forces Committee where he's the ranking member uh, and on the Tactile Air and Land Forces uh, Committee where he's a member. Uh, he's also on the House Committee for Natural Resources uh, as well as uh, the co-chair of the Congressional Shipbuilding Caucus, which is relevant to today's discussion. Uh, prior to being in Congress, uh, Congressman Whitman also served in the Virginia House of Delegates. Uh, we're also joined by Congressman Mike Gallagher from uh, the 8th District in Wisconsin. Uh, Congressman Gallagher is a member of the House Armed Services Committee as well. Uh, he is the ranking member on the Personnel Subcommittee, uh, as well as sitting on the Sea Power and Power Projection Forces Subcommittee. Uh, he's also a member of the House Committee on uh, Transportation and Infrastructure and sits on several subcommittees there. Uh, prior to coming to Congress, uh, Congressman uh, Gallagher was a, an active duty Marine, uh, served as a counterintelligence uh, and human intelligence officer, as well as a regional affairs officer, uh, and deployed twice to Al-Anbar province uh, in Iraq during the war there uh, as a commander of intelligence teams. Uh, and he served uh, up to the rank of captain before he uh, entered into Congress. Uh, we want to thank both of you for being here, Congressman, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Great to be so with you. So good to be with you. So that, to start off the conversation, uh, I thought maybe we could uh, kind of open it up with a, uh, the bigger uh, competition that's underway right now between the United States and China. Um, the Biden administration in uh, putting out its initial uh, uh, proposal for the infrastructure bill that's currently being considered by uh, Congress, the American Jobs Plan, uh, cited the competition with China as one of the reasons behind that effort. Uh, the uh, competition with China, when you take it down to the, the military competition, uh, is not going well for the United States. Uh, we've, we've arguably fallen behind in several mission areas, uh, one of those being naval forces. Uh, China has been uh, very aggressively building its shipbuilding industry, uh, has been expanding it, and is building a wide variety of ships um, at a rapid pace. Uh, meanwhile, the U.S. shipbuilding industry has consolidated over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. Uh, even though we've got a little bit over 100 shipyards today in the U.S., uh, only about 20 are able to build larger vessels that could be used for military or Coast Guard purposes. Um, and uh, of those 20, we've only got seven that devote themselves entirely to building just uh, Navy ships. Uh, and even a couple of those are, um, or at least one of those is in uh, peril as we go into this uh, next shipbuilding plan because it might not get any future ships. And as a result, might have to think about another line of work. Um, our shipbuilding base is contracting, China's is growing. Uh, on the repair side, we've got challenges as well that we will discuss today. Um, yeah, first of all, to, 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 you know, then to, to talk about this in the terms of the China competition, um, yeah, how are we faring with regard to this overall competition with China? And how is our shipbuilding and repair, our maritime industrial base uh, performing as a component of that competition? Uh, so first, uh, Congressman Whitman, what do you think? Well, listen, I, I believe that our industrial base for the capacity that's there is, is performing extraordinarily well. The problem is we just don't have enough of that capacity. If you look at the plan for shipbuilding, the 2021 shipbuilding plan that was just unveiled, it is absolutely insufficient. The president's budget request is insufficient. Uh, you can't do addition by subtraction. We will not be able to keep up with the efforts of the Chinese in building their Navy, which, by the way, now has more ships than our Navy. And those ships are very capable ships. The president's budget this year proposes to build eight ships. Two of those are tugboats, proposes to retire 15 ships. Seven of those are cruisers. Think about this. The vertical launch system capability in those cruisers is equivalent to the entire British Navy. So we see what capacity we're losing. I'm not a mathematician, but it's hard for me to see how you do addition by subtraction. When the chairman of the Joint Chiefs says we much have a, we need to have a much larger fleet. And in order to have dominant capability over China and any other adversary, that is quintessential to, to this nation. 
This budget doesn't do that. So we are running counter to what the chairman of our Joint Chiefs says that we need to have. Uh, and we don't have the capacity either to keep up with Chinese capacity to maintain those ships. So it's not just about building those ships, but it's about maintaining those ships. We are far behind China in the trajectory for building our Navy. We're behind China in the, in the shipyard infrastructure that we need. Uh, and we are well behind in what this year's budget proposes in what we need to do on a trajectory to build our Navy, to get anywhere close to being able to compete with the pacing threat of China. Uh, yeah, indeed. I mean, the Chinese are building their fleet up at the rate of 10 new ships per year. So it's growing at a rate of 10 per year. Um, and uh, argue, the folks argue that the ships are not built as well. I've seen some Chinese ships and that might be true, but with the amount of ship repair uh, capacity they have, that may not be an issue because they can probably get those ships back in the field more quickly than we could ever, ever could. Uh, uh, Congressman Gallagher, turning to you, uh, what do you think we are with regard to the competition of China and particularly the maritime industrial uh, aspect of it? Well, I agree with everything that Rob Whitman said. Uh, it's always a, an honor to be with him, though it's intimidating because uh, he's forgotten more about sea power than I will ever know. And I'm, to the extent I've achieved anything in my five years in Congress, it's just because I'm, I'm Whitman's wingman. I just follow him around and I sort of echo what he says. Uh, but, um, you know, what I find interesting is that we now have public testimony from not just Admiral Davidson, uh, you know, former commander of Indo-PACOM, uh, but also reaffirmed by the CNO and the commandant last week, warning us that um, the PLA could make a move on Taiwan within the next six, six years. So what I've called the Davidson window is closing every day. And we have plans that project out to build a battle force in 2045. We have 30 year shipbuilding plans, or maybe we do, we don't get them from the administration in violation of US law. Um, when we really need to be thinking more immediately in terms of what we can do prior to 2025 to, in order to deter that most stressing case of a fait accompli strategy against Taiwan. And that may seem like a dark future, but it's one that I believe is heading our way sooner rather than later if we fail to act. And just building on a lot of what Rob said, I mean, since 2005, the PLA Navy has grown its battle force by 100 and 17 ships. And over the same period, the US Navy battle force has grown by five. That is not, that is not the right trend line. Um, and I always remember in my freshman term when I went out to one of our master repair yards uh, for ships out on the West Coast in San Diego, and they were telling me about uh, a dry dock that they'd recently built and invested millions of dollars in. And uh, you know, as part of this sort of expected pivot to the Pacific, we'd be deploying more Navy ships out there. Uh, and they would need more repairs. Uh, and I said, well, where'd you build it? And he said, well, we built it in China. Uh, and we had to cut it into three pieces and ship it back across the Pacific. So a lot of just the critical infrastructure we need to repair our ships is, is being built uh, by, our, uh, by our enemy, uh, which is crazy. And I think the biggest takeaway from the pandemic is, is going to be all of us sort of waking up to the, the critical vulnerabilities in our supply chain and a lot of the single points of failure that affect our supply chain and engage in this good faith effort to onshore and nearshore. But we got a long, long way to go. Uh, yeah, that's it, it, it's always surprising to the degree to which uh, even our military systems depend on Chinese uh, supply chain elements or indirectly on the Chinese, um, which they're more than happy to supply, I, I assume. They're more than happy to get uh, in inside of our military industrial base, uh, as well as be able to make the money off of it. Um, it's, it seems like you know, part of, I think, what, what, what seems to be happening with uh, the Chinese, too, is a, a messaging campaign. I mean, they're, they're using the expansion of their fleet. They're using the, the expansion of its capability also as a way to intimidate, arguably, their, their, uh, their neighbors, their potential adversaries, uh, potent, you know, particularly in their near abroad. Um, do, do you, it seems like that has been relatively successful uh, of late. Um, in getting uh, folks in that region to start reevaluating their alliances with the United States or their potential dependence on the United States. Are you seeing any of that, um, you know, Congressman Gallagher? And then I'll turn to you, Congressman Whitman. Well, it's interesting to me in um, April uh, of last year, when I, like many of you, was trapped in my basement because mm -hmm. Congress had disbanded and we weren't going anywhere because of the pandemic, I took the time to watch uh, 
Wolf Warrior One and Wolf Warrior Two, which are available on YouTube, highest grossing uh, Chinese movies of all time, or at least Wolf Warrior Two is. And it's easy to dismiss that. Uh, and these are the movies that have uh, given life to the so-called Wolf Warrior diplomacy, where she has dispatched all his diplomats, uh, primarily on American social media to spread dangerous propaganda and jingoistic rhetoric. It's easy to dismiss it as just sort of ham-handed over the top, but uh, they're really, they have a huge following, uh, not just uh, domestically, um, but uh, regionally. And more to the point, their audience is an audience of one. It's Xi Jinping himself who has consolidated uh, all of the power. And so I don't know. My own view is that uh, she views the effectuation of unification of Taiwan with the mainland as, as a legacy issue. I don't know if it, he's going to do something foolish in the next five years, but I think we have to plan as if he's going to. And if he's looking around the world, he probably sees, hey, Russia got away with uh, invading a country. Um, you know, uh, the Americans seem pretty divided politically right now. Um, you know, and then we have a lot of bills that are coming due in terms of uh, we have to pay for on the defense side. So maybe this decade would be a good idea, a good time to test the limits. And that's you sort of have to assume that and plan accordingly. Uh, yeah. And um, and Congressman Whitman, that, that gets back to your point about uh, decommissionings and kind of how the Navy seems to be, uh, at least in this current budget, I guess, previous budgets as well, but most importantly in this FY22 budget, focused on the future. They are uh, looking to put R&D towards future classes of ships uh, at the expense of procurement today and at the expense of uh, current ships and their ONS expenses. So they're trying to offload those expenses and shift that money to buying the next generation of technologies. But those technologies may not show up until after this decade is over and the window that we're talking about here is passed. Um, are you concerned that that's an element of this is that the, the Chinese might be actually um, operating within a much tighter window than we might have been planning for? Well, Brian, let me begin by, uh, by pointing out uh, that uh, my colleague is also tremendously uh, well-versed in the issues involving sea power and all the issues on the House Armed Services Committee, extraordinarily bright and talented. And, uh, and I tell folks, uh, you know, it's, I appreciate his, his kind comments towards me, but, but my goal in life is to grow up and be like Mike Gallagher. So, <laughs> so anyway, but, but along those lines, as far as where China's going, where we are on that path, China's on a, an extraordinarily aggressive path to build capability. And their focus is to have a naval force that can sustain operations worldwide. You know, it used to be you'd look at them as a regional force. Now, that's not on the track that they're on. And listen, their, their ships, while they have more ships than we have, uh, their newer ships coming online are extraordinarily capable. And, and even our leaders uh, in the Marine Corps in the Navy and even General Milley have stated that the capability in China is growing and is of issue in relation to United States capability. As they continue to grow their force, as Representative Gallagher pointed out, the pathway that they are on in the number of ships that they have built and are on track to build is, is at a much, much higher rate than the track that the United States is on whether it's historically or what is proposed in this year's budget. And while certainly our ships have great capability, quantity has a quality all its own. And my concern is, is that it is in not in the too distant future that we will see this delta of, of, of difference in capability and capacity in the United States and China continue to grow. And listen, China is opportunistic. And think about the calculus that they go through in looking at when they could attempt to take Taiwan back. Admiral Davidson pointed this out. He believes that that, that, that window is going to be much sooner than later. Uh, as we continue on this path, we sent a clear message to China with only building eight ships, two of which are tugboats and retiring 15, that we're on the path of, of reducing the size and capability of, of our Navy. And the whole idea that somehow we're going to take those savings, which remember in these ship retirements occur over years and somehow immediately get replacement capability is a fallacy. That replacement capability doesn't even occur within the future year's defense plan, the fit up as it's known. Uh, that's way out in the future. So we give up capability today for some future promise in the future. Brian, I argue that all the dreams of the United States in military capability are now occurring outside the fit-up. 
which is pretty alarming as to where we are. China looks at that. I think it opens up their window. If they see an opportunity, believe me, with as, with as aggressive as Xi Jinping is, I believe that they will take that opportunity because they aren't sure what happens after that. But if they see that opportunity with the broadening delta between U.S. naval capability and Chinese uh, naval capability, I believe that they will take that opportunity. That's a, I mean, it's a, it's a great point, and it, it, it totally inverts a lot of the planning assumptions the Navy, I think, has been working around, which is it's a 30-year plan. Uh, we're going to you know, build for the future. When we did the FNFS last year, we were looking at a 2045 to 2050 timeframe. Um, that all probably needs to go out the window, and we probably need to start thinking much more about what does the Navy look like in 2030 um, and invest in a way that allows us to have that capability uh, maximized and then you know, maybe accept risk in the in the future, which is the the opposite of what I think the Navy has been doing. Um, uh, it in your discussions with the Navy has does it appear that they are starting to get that message, or is this or is this being driven by you know, external forces, the administration trying to come up with a way to save money, or do you think this is legitimately a future focused effort that they think is the right answer? Well, I'll start. Then I want to turn over to my colleague, right. Mr. Gallagher. Um, I, I believe that we are in unfortunately a familiar place, and that is budgets driving strategy. Uh, and the strategy needs to be driven by the threats that we face and what we need to do to maintain our position in the world as a strategic leader. And once you yield that space, it is extraordinarily difficult to get it back. And if you aren't on trajectory to make the necessary investments each year to build that capability, to modernize, to build the capacity, you can't just skip a year. And listen, it, it, this isn't unique to this administration. We've seen it in the past administration where it, it's taken a little bit of time for them to figure out, hey, naval power is the key to the future, especially in the Indo-Pacific. You can't afford to skip a year because even if you say, well, we're going to mark time this year and then next year we'll pick up the pace, you never get that year back. You, you never get that time back in the ships that China's built and now the additional ones that that the U.S. attempts to build because the industrial base is limited in capacity. There's a limited amount of dollars that you can actually operationalize in a budget unless you make massive increases. And I argue even if you make massive increases, which is not likely, but even if you make massive increases, there's not the capacity in the industrial base to do that. So that's why a steady path of continuing to build ships, more ships than what you retire each year, and you have the capacity to maintain those ships is the way that you sustain a Navy capable of deterring the Chinese. I agree with uh, Representative Whitman. You know, it's sort of like Navy Groundhog Day, right? We, we've seen this play out time and time again. And it's always some promise of a future uh, uh, capability or some magical third offset thinking that's going to solve all of our problems. And, you know, particularly, it's particularly egregious now because at the same time, in my opinion, you know, by the Biden budget overall is proposing to spend more in real terms than we did uh, during World War II, largely for domestic progressive priorities. They're unwilling to spend the minimum necessary to prevent World War III. And then I think they're both in the executive and legislative branch, there's an unwillingness to make what I consider a few fundamental hard budgetary choices. Uh, potentially one being breaking the one-third, one-third, one-third split between the services, recognizing the paramount importance of integrated American sea power based on just looking at the map of Indo-PACOM, uh, and, and then two, you know, sharing the bill for, for Colombia uh, are, are two that stand out in my mind. The one area I think that gives me a little bit of optimism where I think we're, we're thinking a little bit creatively, particularly with a shorter time frame in mind and in a genuine attempt to deter a PLA invasion by denial is with uh, the Commandant uh, of the Marine Corps and his force design and, and some of the innovative uh, ideas he's put out there, uh, particularly the use of, of long range fires. Uh, my view is we have a huge opportunity now that we're no longer by, bound by the strictures of, of the INF Treaty to um, use long range fires and INF non-compliant missiles to, to hold their ships at risk at low cost, really sort of flipping the anti-access aerial denial script against the PLA Navy. And that to me is the key for getting creative in the short term at the same time we continue to fund our long-term priorities. 
Yeah, that, uh, I think that's that's a it raises a great point about you know how we need to be focused on uh, China as the main competitor uh, and as the, the the forcing function for a lot of our decision making. And uh, I think we still see a lot of examples in the budget where we're buying things that are maybe not designed in, in a way that that is optimized for the China threat. Um, and I think with the force design, the, the commandant has really embraced it and said, this is our main problem. Let's make sure that our force reflects the challenges of that main problem and isn't trying to be necessarily the Swiss army knife for every possible situation. Um, which uh, is so, so you're going to some specifics now. Um, you've, you've both mentioned, uh, Congressman Whitten mentioned in particular, the, the need for a steady growth in the size of the fleet and in the, the capability of the fleet. And instead of this sort of uh, divest to invest approach that the, the administration is reflecting in its current budget. Um, right now, if you look at that budget, we're going um, we're, we're to try to increase the production of submarines. But on the surface combatant side and on the amphibious side, we're taking reductions uh, and we're going to, you know, in some cases, stop building ship classes that, that are currently in production, like the uh, LPD uh, Flight Two. Um, you know, Congressman Whitman, what, what do you think that are, are the, what are the challenges involved then if for the shipbuilding industrial base and our ability to get the future capability that the uh, administration argues they think they need um, when we when we stop production of current classes of ships uh, in the hopes of you know coming up with something better later. Um, it seems like it's not going to be, uh, there's going to be this gap uh, and that we're not going to get back uh, the industrial capacity we're going to lose. Well, Brian, let me build on what uh, Representative Gallagher talked about. He's spot on when he talks about the path that the Marines are on. The Commandant has the exact pathway, I believe, to make sure that we can counter uh, Chinese efforts uh, in the Indo-Pacific. One of the things that's critical of that is the current block buy that is in OSDK to purchase uh, one LHD and three LPD flight twos. That is critically important to execute that contract because multiple buys assure us that the Marine Corps will be on track to have the ships that they need. The 2021 shipbuilding plan has them from 24 to 26 amphibs. The Commandant has said 31 needs to be the floor. I think it puts them at unnecessary risk. And the Commandant said that the other day in the posture hearing. So I think those things are incredibly important. We need to do everything we can to get OSD CAPE to execute that particular contract, because short of that, the Marine Corps will not have the capability they need to move, to be mobile and agile, to move around the Pacific. Uh, the light amphibious warfare vessel, better known as LAWS, is an incredibly important part of that, uh, to be distributed uh, across the Pacific, to be able to move, to be able to create uncertainty for the Chinese. Those things are incredibly important as to the future path for the Navy Marine Corps team and what it does in the Pacific to hold the Chinese uh, at risk. Long range precision fires are key, long range anti-ship missiles are the key. Uh, and that's a way for us to, in addition to having the, the warship capability there, especially surface fleet capability, is to have that to create uncertainty there. The investment in that has to occur quickly. We have to get those assets online uh, and not executing that four ship buy for amphibious ships I think creates uh, unacceptable risk for the Navy Marine Corps team. And the Commandant said as much the other day at, at our hearing. Yeah, I, so, so oh, go, go ahead. ahead yeah. No, I was just going to say, you know, I always, you asked about some of the roadblocks. Well, I think back, I mean, I came into Congress in 2017 and uh, Brian at that time, I mean, you were participating in one of the three different Naval force structure reviews that were conducted by CSBA, MITRE and the Navy. And all the reviews differed on the specifics, but they were aligned in one critical area, which is yeah. the idea that we needed a bigger fleet ASAP. Right. <laughs> but over the course of 2018 and 2019, and despite the fact that che then Chairman Whitman had you know, made getting to 355 as soon as practically possible a matter of U.S. law, uh, the Navy kept pushing back its timeline for delivering a post-NDS force structure assessment. Right. Secretary Esper comes in, he takes over the process and ultimately produces Battle Force 2045, but we didn't have it fully in hand until December 2020. And now the Biden Pentagon is saying that we have to go back to the drawing board. So what's the biggest roadblock? It's, it's, that, it's that lack of, of consistent leadership. You know, It's that we don't have that, that layman-like figure right. sort of evangelizing for integrated right. American sea power with the support of the president, which is, which is what you need. Yeah. Otherwise, the status quo, I think, is going to win out in the building and on Capitol Hill. Right. Uh, well, and that, right, we have a and we have a Secretary of the Navy nominee uh, with um, 
uh, Del Toro coming in potentially. The um, the challenge, as you note, is going to be: does that uh, chair or does that secretary have the support of the president? You know, if because John Lehman, arguably when he was advocating for the six hundred ship navy, was doing it because the president was behind him all the way and was going to make those resources available. And it sounds like what um, uh, Secretary Del Toro will face is going to be a, a situation where he's having to make the best of a situation where he's been given a budget constraint that he has to operate within uh, and make the best of uh, make the best of it. Um, so uh, going back to the uh, the question of amphibs, the one thing I want to ask you, uh, Congressman Gallagher, also was um, this new force design that the Marine Corps is uh, describing. Uh, Congressman Whitman brought up the light amphibious warship, obviously as a big component of moving Marines around littoral environments. Um, it seems like if we're going to equip them and support them properly, then we need these amphibs in order to provide the, the backup. Um, and then also, uh, do we need to think about how do we equip uh, amphibious ships differently for the China context? Than we might have equipped them in the past. And, and then the last thing is, um, it seems also like what the, the Commandant's saying is, if we're going to focus on China with most of the military, um, somebody has to be available to do the other things that come up. You know, so when something happens in the Middle East, when something happens in uh, South Asia or Africa, uh, who's going to be called upon to do that is probably the Marine Corps. So it seems like amphibious ships will be the mechanism that gets them there in numbers. I mean, it seems like there's the, there, a lot of people will want to walk away from the amphibs as an element of the fleet. It seems like there's way, there's arguments for why we need to keep them both in the China context uh, and in for these other situations. Well, I've certainly been persuaded by those arguments. And I think Representative Whitman hit the nail on the head when he talked about that 31 floor. I think it's essential to implementing the Commandant's Force design, as well as uh, covering down uh, on some other missions as they arrive. And you know, one thing that strikes me is that while on the surface, these changes might seem revolutionary, you know, I'd argue that they're facilitating a very old and familiar concept of operations. I mean, just look at the role that the Marine Corps played at the defense of islands like Wake uh, early on uh, in the war, where we had land-based aviation and coastal artillery that just punched well above their weight against Japanese invasion forces. Uh, and, and so I, I think that the Marine Corps uh, is, is, is taking a historically informed approach uh, to its future. And it's something that um, navalists uh, like myself and, and Representative Whitman need to be supportive of uh, uh, going forward and push back on, on some of the, the, uh, the arguments that we're hearing on the other side. Yeah, so uh, Congressman Whitman, the, uh, the, one of the challenges with uh, growing the fleet has been uh, obviously the support of the administration. Um, what are some of the other roadblocks that you've seen come up? Because um, there's been no, as, as Congressman Gallagher said, no lack of analysis um, arguing for a larger fleet. Um, you know, I did, did two different studies, both of which argued for a bigger fleet in a lot of, in a lot of the same ways. Um, what do you think the things are that are holding us back? Well, you point out this administration and previous administrations too in their hesitancy to, to move forward on the right pace. Another thing that sometimes doesn't get mentioned, but I think is also critically important, and that is the industrial base. Because the industrial base right now is what I believe at, a, at an absolute minimum. And the challenge is allowing yards to survive as we change platforms. Great example are some of the shipyards down in the Gulf, like Austin and others. We need those yards. We need that capacity. You cannot afford to lose those yards. So the question is, if you're going to be reducing the number of ships that you build, how do you sustain an industrial base? Not just the physical facilities, but also the manpower. We need shipbuilders that are experts at welding, at sheet metal, at electrician work. All those elements uh, have to be remembered in this. And we also have to make sure that these yards see a future a future where they're willing to invest in their yards or where they're willing to modernize their yards, where they're willing to make sure their yards are more productive. Because I argue in the future, Brian, it's not just about building that capability, but the strategic competition in the future will be, can we get more out of our dollar than the Chinese get per their yuan or the Russians get per their ruble? Because we are not going to have unlimited resources. As Representative Gallagher pointed out, we have, we have a record amount of debt in this nation approaching 100% of GDP, that is going to impede the number of dollars that we can spend. So I've encouraged everybody across the board is, you know, we have to, we have to do more with the dollars that we put out there. And I know it's an overused uh, a phrase to say do more with less, but on the current track, we're going to do less with less unless things change. I think we have to properly resource things, but we also have to find creative and innovative ways to be able to do more. 
uh, the commandant, I think, is looking at that. How, how do we take the forces we have? How do we distribute them? How do we make them more lethal? How do we do that within the context of the uh, limited amount of resources? But let me tell you, if you're going to go down to 24 amphibious ships, you will do less with less. You will increase the risk for the Marines that are out there. You will increase the risk for the sailors that are out there trying to prosecute this mission across the Indo-Pacific. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, right, and the uh, you know and that also raises the 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 uh, shrinking the size of the fleet also means you're going to be working it harder. So that means you're going to be increasing the risk on the backside for the material condition and the the training uh, proficiency and then everything that goes into readiness of the fleet. Uh, so you're you're incurring a cost on the back end because uh, you're going to end up with ships as we've seen with the carrier fleet today, um, where they're unable to deploy when the time comes and we're having to move ships around and and gr gate the strategic risk of losing the coverage uh, as we are with the the Ronald Reagan. Um, Congressman Gallagher, uh, you, the, uh, we've talked about personnel as, a, as an element of this. Uh, the current economic environment or the employment environment is such that uh, when shipbuilders or ship repair yards lose somebody, they may not get them back because they may decide to go into a different line of work because there's lots of jobs out there. Um, how do we uh, need to think about uh, growing the shipyard workforce because all the shipyards are arguing they don't have enough people um, and also try to retain those folks uh, even if we're not going to have necessarily the steadiest of, of shipbuilding plans going forward. Uh, are there ways that we can try to maximize the, the utilization and the, the, the reliability of that employment? Well, this is the biggest economic issue in Wisconsin. I'm sure the picture is similar in uh, Virginia. Uh, it was the biggest issue prior to the pandemic, and the pandemic has exacerbated it. You talk to any business, not just, you know, Fink and Terry in my district and shipbuilders or Oshkosh, but, you know, a restaurant, whatever, small, medium, large business, and they'll tell you, we can't find workers, right? Uh, it, you know, we'll, we'll have 10 people show up for a job, you know, two people pass the drug test, and only one will show up to work. I mean, that's, you know, there's some immediate things we can do, uh, in my opinion, ending the unemployment plus up, which is a clear disincentive to work would be a good idea. I proposed repurposing it to a reemployment bonus where you give people money if they keep a job for more than four weeks. Uh, but it is a bigger issue than that. Uh, it's a, an issue that's going to involve a, a cultural change in our K through 12 system. Uh, we paid a lot of lip service to the idea that you know, my district, uh, you don't need to go to a four year UW university, you can go right to NWTC, learn to weld, NWTC has a creative partnership with the shipyard. Within a year, two years, you're making a ton of money building something really cool for the US Navy. And a lot of people pay lip service to that. But then when I ask parents about it, I say, well, what are your kids doing? And they say, well, my kids going to a four year university. So part of it involves the cultural stigma around uh, going right into the workforce. One thing that happened in my district, I'm sorry to go on, I'll end after this, that I thought was really cool and uh, an indication of where we need to go is uh, one of the, the, the pipe fitting union, uh, which does work with my shipyard, they had an apprenticeship signing day. So for all the kids that were starting their apprenticeship path, they kind of had a ceremony like, you know, the star athlete at your high school when they would sign with a big university and all of us were there. And that, that to me was just a great, a great idea. And I think is an indication of how we get kids into the workforce and potentially into the, the shipbuilding industrial base, because it's a, a huge, huge problem. We also need people to have more kids. I don't know how to incentivize that at a federal level. I'll, I'll stop. My, my Catholic sensibilities might bleed through, but we've got a demographic problem, but I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if the Shipyard Act's really going to be able to cover That's that. Right. That might That's be right. a side element of the, of the act. Uh, but, to, but, it, but in terms of the Shipyard Act, I mean, we, to, to, to talk about that, uh, Congressman Whit Whitman, one of the um, you know, elements that the administration has talked about in the American Jobs Plan is retraining, uh, preparing folks for the future uh, economy and jobs that are going to be in demand in the future. Uh, we do have a very tight employment environment today, which means jobs are going to have to probably pay more in order to get people to come and stay there uh, and be able to retain them. Um, can we do more when it comes to the shipbuilding and ship repair industry to try to uh, back, give them better training capacity, give them more attractive training pipelines and make those jobs uh, more attractive to folks to come into? Because uh, that seems like that's something that the American Jobs Plan, even though it doesn't currently address it, should be addressing. Um, and that there may be an opportunity for the Shipyard Act to provide some of that support. Absolutely, Brian. Well, listen, there are a number of things we can do. One is to make sure that we adjust where dollars are available to students to do other than a two or four year degree, just as Representative Gallagher pointed out. I have a bill in called the Propel Act that allows the largest source 
of funds for students, that is Pell Grants, to be used for other than two and four year degree pursuits. So if you need to go get a certification or credential, you ought to be able to use the Pell Grants. Additionally, states have 529 savings plans where you can take money tax-free and save it for tuition for your, uh, for your child. Uh, what I want to make sure is we expand that to allow it to be used for certifications and credentials. I, I want to make sure we're incentivizing folks to go into the career and technical education path. That is critical. What can we do through the Shipyard Act is this. We can make sure we modernize our yards because especially our public yards are so antiquated. The dry docks are so old that I believe they are soon going to propose, oppose safety hazards. Second of all, if you go to those yards, you see how old they are. I mean, these are these are circa World War II yards where you go there and you go, wow, I feel like I've stepped back in time. Uh, and if you look at competing for workers and retaining workers and they can go to an old antiquated shipyard where they have to walk thousands of feet to go back and forth between a shop and the ship they're working on and they can go to a private sector yard where things are much more modern, we know where they're going to end up. And now you have to compete for that skill set with other parts of industries that need welders, that need electricians, that need sheet metal workers. And they're working in modern facilities that are bright and clean and, and conditioned. Uh, I can tell you, it, it makes it impossible to compete for those workers. So modernizing for the, the facilities, making sure that we make resources available for those folks that may want to either change track or come out of high school and get trained in those career tracks. And as Representative Gallagher pointed out, let me tell you, these are extraordinarily successful career tracks. If you are a, a, a journeyman or for that matter, a master shipbuilder, you know, you're, you're in making in the upper five figures, sometimes lower six figures, uh, which is much more than you could make with a with the degree with an oversupply of graduates in certain areas. So, you know, we ought to be highlighting that and parents need to understand that, too. I think a lot of times they think oh, I don't want my kid to go into a career in technical education field because it's dirty and it's low paying. No, these are high paying jobs and they are in areas where if we modernize the shipbuilding industry, I can tell you when I when I grew up in that area of Virginia, the Newport News Apprentice School was on the equivalent of any college in the area. They had a, a tremendous athletics program there where, where, where folks would go there and go to school. They participate in athletic, world-class athletics, and they would get a certification there to go to work in the yard. And, and those folks are working there now 40 years plus later as master shipbuilders. We can do this, but we've got to make sure we reemphasize the importance of career and technical education. That's a, a fantastic point. And uh, the modernizing of the shipyards, I think, is a terrific uh, point, too. So, so Congressman Gallagher, the, the Shipyard Act puts uh, you know, $20 billion uh, towards or $21 billion towards the SIOP, the Shipyard Improvement, the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan that the Navy has. Um, there's been some discussion from uh, Congressman Garamundi and others about making that a shorter time window instead of doing it over 20 years, giving the Navy five years worth of money to go do that. Um, that seems like that's not really the right answer just because it seem, takes, it takes a long time to uh, upgrade a shipyard, especially if you're using it. Um, are we putting enough money in the Shipyard Act towards the public shipyards, uh, one, and then are we going to have to rethink how that money is distributed over time because you're going to have to, you know, you're simultaneously upgrading the, the shipyard while you're still using it to do repair work? Well, you know, I think $21 billion is, is a good start. Uh, I'm old enough to remember when that was a, a big sum of money. Uh, compared to what we're throwing around uh, these days. Uh, but of course, it's something that we'll have to evaluate, particularly in light of what is another priority in the bill, which is to invest in uh, the construction of new commercial shipyards, right? So we got $2 billion to help subsidize key upgrades and modernization projects um, for on the commercial side. Um, and uh, full use of the Defense Production Act, uh, Title III authorities to support production, uh, protection or restoration of critical infrastructure. So, you know, I view this as the opening act in a much larger discussion. I very much hope it will be part of uh, an infrastructure bill. But again, I think we're trapped in the fundamental problem of the infrastructure discussion on the Hill, which is that we are just blowing the lids off the place when it comes to all sorts of domestic progressive priorities while failing to focus on what is absolutely essential, uh, like our shipyards. Uh, and imagine if we had sort of a public campaign around how important, you know, the Navy is to our defense, how important the shipbuilding industry is. I think that would go a long way towards 
solving the problem that Representative Whitman laid out, right? You know, you'd start to connect the dots with the next generation that not only are you going to make a lot of money, but you're, you're serving your country uh, by building warships, right? You're helping that, you know, Lance Corporal, uh, you know, or whatever, uh, accomplish the mission and come home safe, right? That, that is a, that's a patriotic endeavor. Uh, so there's a sort of, there's a PR element of this that I think is missing as well. Yeah, and, and uh, the, the Shipyard Act has in some ways kind of flown below the radar because it is uh, relatively small compared to the trillions of dollars we're talking about in the overall ship, the overall infrastructure plan. Uh, the, uh, so Congressman Whitman, I, I, one, of the, um, one of the issues I think that's come up in the course of the discussion about the Shipyard Act or the PSYOP too, mm -hmm. is uh, the fact that we rely, we're starting to rely now on the private ship uh, repair industry to do some of the work that the public ship repair yards have done previously. So nuclear repair work on submarines and, and aircraft carriers. So those are being picked up increasingly to the surge volume over at uh, places like uh, Heinton Ingalls uh, and at General Dynamics. Um, and we also you know, currently rely completely on the private ship repair of facilities for our surface vessels, including the amphibious fleet. Um, so there, there's a there's a huge need over there for them to get the kind of support that allows them to sustain the level of production that they need to keep the fleet going. Especially as ships become more complex, the repair work becomes more challenging um, and takes longer time, more man hours. Um, what do we think? Uh, what do you think we need to do to be able to support those private yards, both in picking up the load from the public yards, especially if the public yards are being upgraded and, and need a place to offload their work, um, and also those private yards that support the, the surface and amphibious fleets? Well, Brian, we are absolutely going to need the private yards in any scenario, but especially as we, I believe, need to get on the fast track to improve our public yards. Some of that work the public yards do is going to have to go to the private yards. You're going to have to give them the money so they can invest in increasing capacity to provide that interim step so that you can maintain those submarines and nuclear aircraft carriers there in the interim. They do the RCOHs, the, the, the comprehensive refueling and, and, and reconstruction, but the routine maintenance, I think some of that's gonna to have to be pushed over. R remember, you know, we have limited capability even in our public yards. We have one dry dock uh, in Norfolk, dock six, that does uh, carrier uh, work. We have one dock in Puget Sound, dock eight, that, does, that can do carrier work, that it can actually accommodate the four class carriers. So we're very, very limited in that scope. We're gonna need to take down some of those dry docks for a period of time in order to rebuild them. That means these ships are gonna to have to go elsewhere for routine maintenance. So it means that Huntington Ingalls Industries is gonna to have to, to devote some of their workforce and time to that. The same with general dynamics on submarines, some of those Virginia class submarines, and we see the Boise that has now been out going on five years as it now goes through that, that maintenance availability. And listen, the, those uh, private yards have to regain the muscle memory on what they used to do, which was to maintain these ships. So we're gonna have to do that. And we're doing that in the face of Ford class coming on and needing to be repaired in the face of Columbia class coming on. There's gonna be a perfect storm of needed capacity that's not there today. If we're on the right track, I listen, the, the 20 year uh, PSYOPs plan, I think needs to be compressed to 10. I think you can do it in 10, but you can only do it in 10 if you make the necessary investments in private yards so they have the capacity as a bridge. And I would argue we need to keep that capacity because that capacity is a national asset that helps us counter what we know is today's Chinese capacity. If we ever get into a conflict to have the ability to turn these ships around quickly uh, for maintenance or to, to get those ones that are in the yard and maybe quickly get them to sea so we can surge in case of a conflict. Could I, could I two finger on that? Because th that's a critical point. I mean, if you think back to the tragic collision in 2017, I believe it took more than 22 months to finish repairs on the fits due to limited shipyard capacity. And even worse, it took close to four years to repair uh, the, the USS Boise, if memory serves. Um, but you think about that, those delays occurred in peacetime. Imagine what the backlog is going to be like if the Chinese start punching holes in our hulls, right? I mean, that, that, that things get a lot more complicated in that scenario. So sorry to chime in. I just, Representative Whitman raises a critical point. 
No, no, and that uh, that brings up a great point. And the other uh, thing that jumps out at me when from that conversation is um, you need the proficiency be, to be able to do the kind of ship repair work. And I think that's one thing that we've seen with uh, both General Dynamics and Huntington Ingalls is that it's a, just a totally different job to repair an existing ship than to build a new one because it's not as routine, routinized. You know, you have to build the work package from scratch every time. Um, so there's also an element of this that we not only need to give them the the, the infrastructure capacity to support it, but we probably need to give them the the reliable level of work so that they can then build that you know that proficiency that that set of work workers that are skilled at doing the kind of repair work that's necessary which is probably a different set of skills than they need to, to build the ship in the first place so they need that demand signal that forces them to be able to have that set of workers set aside um, which is a different different strategy for how we do ship maintenance than we do it today uh, where we kind of just use them as the surge capacity but we probably need to think of them as having that's an element of our capacity we need to have uh, com consistently you know uh, employed um, so so one thing I so Carsman Gallagher one thing that I, I was thinking too is um, the Coast Guard seems to have been missing from a lot of the conversation when it comes to the Shipyard Act uh, and also with regard to the you know the infrastructure plan writ large um, and you sit on the committee over in uh, over in the house that that oversees the Coast Guard in part so I was wondering what, what were your thoughts on how we could try to improve the repair and uh, and building capacity that the shipyard or that the Coast Guard depends on well, I had something uh, called the Great Lakes Winter Commerce Act that I introduced, a bipartisan bill uh, that would that would just simply codify uh, the Coast Guard's mission on the Great Lakes. It's more of a, you know, parochial or, you know, the Midwesterners will appreciate this, not just the, the East Coasters like Representative Whitman, who look at a, a far vaster expanse of water. Um, but he's he's been up to visit good old Lake Michigan, so he'll understand the importance, but um, you know, 20% of our nation's GDP is generated in the Great Lakes region, uh, and our commerce suffers because of a lack of sufficient icebreaker ice breaking. So, part of what we need to do is build more icebreakers for the Coast Guard. Coast Guard plays a critical role uh, in a variety of you know missions in our in our near abroad here. Uh, a lot of counter narcotics missions as well. You know, I think we don't do enough thinking in terms of integrating the mission of the Coast Guard to what the U.S. Navy is trying to do and really deconflicting those and thinking how we can sort of develop some synergies. And part of that reflects the committee structure and just the, the fact that the Coast Guard is part of DHS. And, and so that, that creates challenges. But that's something that you know, we're trying to prioritize on the Transportation Committee and in, in the Infrastructure Bill. Uh, so um, as we're as we're wrapping up here, Congressman Whitman, I, I wanted to ask you about the um, uh, about just this idea of growing the fleet. Um, we've got a current bill, you know, that's on that or the current proposed budget. I'm sorry, that's on the Hill uh, being considered right now. Is Congress looking at ways to to force the Navy to try to grow, to grow the fleet? Um, and uh, one of the things the Navy has uh, identified is uh, ONS costs is a challenge. That's one of the reasons they're retiring these cruisers early, and that's one of the constraints they identified in their shipbuilding plan as you know, driving down the size of the fleet that they're, they're moving toward. Um, so so the, the fleet that they've identified is going to have some pretty severe limitations, particularly in surface combatants and amphibious ships that we've talked about. Um, how, are we, how are you thinking about uh, trying to get the Navy to grow the fleet? Are we looking at procurement and O&M uh, in, increases? Are we looking at um, you know, trying to get a you know, clean sheet for structure assessment out of the Navy and then come up with different ways to resource it? What are some of your thoughts on how to do that? Well, I think, uh, I think the House uh, Armed Services Committee is going to have to track its own path for this year because it's obvious that uh, the Pentagon in the 30-year shipbuilding plan doesn't provide the granularity necessary. I think it's very insufficient. There's no real path forward for them other than way outside the fit up, which is, you know, which is what all dreams are, are, are made of. But um, I, I want to make sure we're focusing on what do we do as a bridge? What, what do we do this year? And it will be a combined effort. It will have to be, how do we increase the number of surface ships that we build? And even if you fund a DDG-51 Flight 3 this year, that ship's not going to be available except at the very end of the fit-up. So, so as you're retiring these seven CGs, and I've, I've engaged with the CNO to say, you've got to retire them at a different rate. I understand the cost structure there. I understand wanting to invest in the future. But, but to dump this much capacity at one time I think is an unacceptable risk. I understand wanting to, to divest in those, but remember the savings you accrue still are way out in the future. So the key is, is what do we do, first of all, to properly resource uh, maintenance? What do we do to make sure we're level loading the yards? Because what's happened in the past is we've had this roller coaster ride where the yards are full, 
I mean, you, you ride by Norfolk and the Elizabeth River and you see every spot there, every dockside availability, every dry dock. Uh, the dry docks are, are, are doubled with destroyers in there being worked on. And then all of a sudden, two years from now, the yards will be empty. So you can't expect to, to, to have what you need in those yards if you don't level load them. So predictability, proper planning for maintenance, resourcing that maintenance, I believe that we can extend. And remember, we put a lot of money into some of these CGs and modernization, and now we're going to send them out the door. It just doesn't make good sense. Let's properly resource it. Again, we talked about workforce, got to have the workforce there. You have to level load those yards so that they so that folks are knowledgeable about what, about what goes on. You have to look at the contracting mechanism, the, the fixed cost versus versus variable cost, the MISMO versus MACMO. And then the, the elements of the Navy, like MARMAC, specifically MARMAC in our region, has to work with the ship uh, maintenance elements to make sure that those things happen properly. That has not happened in our region. I argue that's the biggest impediment is an ineffective MARMAC in what they've done to not allow ship maintenance to happen the way it needs to. Listen, MARMAC out of the West Coast has done a great job. For some reason, MARMAC there in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia is complacent and ineffective. Something's got to happen. Leadership has to step up in the Navy and say, no, MARMAC is going to be held accountable and we have to make sure that those things get done. Short of that, we won't have the combined effort of building new ships and, and having an aggressive maintenance schedule for the ones we have. I am glad you brought that up about uh, the contracting mechanisms and the oversight, because those are complaints I get all the time from yep. the ship repair industry, because it's challenging for them to have to be able to develop the capacity to do the ship repair that the Navy will need in the future, at the same time, not knowing from one you know month to the next what their demand signal is going to be, so they know what to hire and know when they can make the capital investment. So coming up with new contracting mechanisms and, and, and overseeing contracts in a way that allows the shipyard to get its work done in, a, in an appropriate manner. Um, Congressman Gallagher, what do you think in, in terms of like, how can we grow the fleet while also addressing the challenge of, of ONS costs uh, that the Navy has cited as one of their constraints? Well, I know it's not going to be delivered this year, but I think we'd all agree that the frigate is absolutely essential uh, for, I mean, it, it is a foundational element of the future fleet. And so getting that right, learning the right lessons from the LCS experience, making sure we have a stable design. I understand the need for combat system changes, but for hm and &E in particular, making sure that's stable, we're minimizing changes. Um, uh, and that's, you know, that's the promise of the FREM uh, was that it's a proven design. Obviously, we have U.S. standards. We're going to need to change some things. But to me, that's absolutely critical. You know, frigates can just can go places that other ships can't go for that day to day deterrence, showing the flag. So though those ships aren't going to be delivered this year, I think there's a lot of work we can do this year to get that right uh, and, and make sure that we're delivering on time uh, and, and on budget. And, uh, you know, this is gonna sound silly too. Uh, there, there's something simple I think needs to happen. And, and I've never seen it happen in my short time. I, I think we need just to get the CNO, the Commandant, whoever else from the five-sided building and then, and then a few of us Navalists in Congress together in a room, no cameras, have a map and just in simple terms, have them walk through their theory of the case for what they think the PLA is trying to do, what we need to do to counter it, and just explain, here's what we can do right now, here's what we need to be able to do, and just equip us, invite us into the wargaming process a little bit, so we can better advocate for the Navy on the Hill. That simple, I know that sounds stupid, but that simple conversation rarely happens. Instead, we kind of communicate in a hearing and you know it's an imperfect format. Uh, so I'm an advocate for allowing some, some congressional participation in Navy Wargaming this year. Uh, that's an excellent idea. Uh, as, as, we, as we wrap up here, um, uh, Congressman Whitman, do you have any uh, closing remarks you wanna make before, I, uh, before we uh, end here? Cause I, I wanna give you that chance to, to, to make sure we address anything that, that we failed to capture thus far. Well, absolutely, Brian. Listen, I want to thank you. Thanks for your leadership and your expertise in applying that to asking the tough questions about where we're going with this nation's military. I want to thank the Hudson Institute for, for hosting this. This is a great opportunity. I understand folks you know, want to know and hear more, especially as Representative Gallagher said, outside the committee hearing side. I mean, everybody gets five minutes. You ask your questions. A lot of that's scripted and canned. You know, This is a much more candid conversation where we can get down in, into the details. 
I think one of the biggest challenges this nation is going to face going forward uh, is how do we do the things we need to do to make sure that we continue to be a strategic player in the world and that we don't yield that ground to China. And listen, we're going through times where we're very divided, where attention is taking away from these critical strategic questions. My concern is, is the attention is being paid elsewhere. And as it is, the Chinese are plodding along in a very deliberative way and saying, you know, when the chance is there, we'll take that opportunity. And the problem is, is if we get to a point where we cannot either deter them because they look at the Delta being so great that they're going to take advantage of it, and then in a conflict where there's a quick and decisive action by them that causes us to back up and go, okay, we'll, we'll yield, then that will forever, forever place the United States uh, in, a, in a subservient position in the world. And I would argue at that particular point, the things that make us strong, which is uh, the United States dollar being the world currency and all those things that help us uh, where we are today strategically all go out the window. So, you know, folks can talk about all this other stuff, all these domestic issues, but if we're not strong strategically, everything else implodes from that. Our nation's defense is the foundation for where this nation has been, going all the way back to the Revolutionary War to where we are today. If we capitulate and give up that position, the future for this nation is not what we all desire for it to be. Well said, well said, thank you. Uh, uh, Congressman D Gallagher, uh, any closing remarks before we wrap up? There's not much I can add to that other than to tell <laughs> a quick C story about Representative Whitman. If you ever traveled with him, uh, there's only one commandment that you cannot break, which is that you're not allowed to check a bag because Whitman travels light, he travels fast, and it's all business. It's no fluff. And so that expeditionary mindset is not just something he preaches about on Capitol Hill. He lives it out in his day-to-day -day life. And I, I very much respect that. Me too. That's that's great. That's how I'd like to travel too. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Congressman uh, uh, Mike Gallagher, Congressman Rob Whitman, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, this was a fantastic conversation. Uh, here's hoping that we can get the Shipyard Act and the and the broader Navy uh, budget moving forward in a in a more positive direction. Um, I appreciate your time and um, good luck uh, on this year's defense bill. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking to you later. Uh, thank you everybody for visiting with us at the Hudson Institute and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian.